Well, here we are, we're doing digestion two. In digestion one, if you've viewed it, you know we talked in uh, particular about the dog, cat, and horse, how they're classified, and uh, where you can find out about nutrient requirements of those animals. In this lesson, I'm gonna show you different digestive tracts, some I've drawn, some I've gotten from the internet, and I just want to point out different things, maybe somewhat generic, but then also specific to some animals. So let's go. Okay, here I've got this diagram. You'll agree that it's a pig, and I'm going to enlarge it. And someone's drawn this gastrointestinal tract, you know, the GIT, gastrointestinal tract. Obviously, it's a pig. I can recognize that up here. So obviously, this is cranial. This is caudal. And you can see the digestive tract is depicted as a tube. And it starts at the front end and ends at the back end. And it's amazing. They've labeled the esophagus. Okay, that's going to go from the oral cavity down to the stomach. Then they've got the small intestine. They haven't got the regions labeled, but we will do that later. Then a cecum, and they made it to have some capacity because you should probably realize a pig, it's called a monogastric, has one stomach, but then it's also called a hind gut fermenter because the cecum and the large intestine, especially the early part there, can be quite good at digesting roughage. Remember cecum, the cecum is where bacteria would be digesting roughage. So I thought that was a good little diagram to start with. Okay, now I want to show you a digestive tract that I've drawn and I'm going to enlarge it and we're going to label it and make some comments. Let me orientate you. This is cranial. It looks kind of weird, like it's going to take off and fly or something, but uh, bear with me. Caudal. So this is the anal opening. This is the oral cavity. And let's move this down just a little bit there. Okay. So now I'm going to bring out some labels. And we know this is the mouth. And I'm going to put the mouth right there. And then I've depicted teeth because all of our animals of focus have teeth. And it's really beginning the physical breakdown of the feedstuffs, of the food that's eaten by the animal. They chew their food at least enough to swallow, and that exposes more surface area. And then the next part I want to talk about is the salivary glands. I've got two listed there. They're often in pairs. And you should know that a salivary gland makes saliva. And the saliva travels up a duct, D-U-C-T, into the oral cavity. So that makes salivary glands exocrine glands, right? Okay. Let's keep doing this. Now the stomach, in this case, I, I've got kind of a generic animal here, but you know, if it was a cow, they have four compartments, so I would have to modify that. But our dog, cat, and horse are all monogastrics, one stomach. Gastric is a term that means stomach, okay? Then, I've kind of depicted the pyloric valve. That's the valve that permits ingesta from leaving the stomach and going into the first portion of the small intestine. So it's truly a valve. It's kind of metering what goes out of the stomach. Sometimes people will label it the pyloric sphincter because it is a muscle type organ or structure, I probably should say. And it opens and lets material out. 
and at other times it's closed. Then I've got what's called the exocrine pancreas. Now you're smart enough to remember that the pancreas really has two parts. Exocrine, which means it's going to make some product and expel that product out of a duct, which I've got there. And then you also know there's an endocrine pancreas. But I only want to talk about the exocrine right now. Okay. Then I've got the liver there. And again, I've got it attached to the small intestine. And there's good reason for that because an animal will send bile down a duck. Now I'm going to label the gallbladder right there. I've got it in green. But you know, for example, the horse does not have a gallbladder. So if a horse, if an animal doesn't have a gallbladder, it's still going to make bile, but it's going to be kind of continuously put into the small intestine. Okay? If you have a gallbladder, like a cat and a dog, then you can give the intestine more bile, especially after you ate a fat mouse or ate a lot of fat from some animal that you uh, devoured. Okay, well then, after, well, this whole area, there's it's small intestine, right? I mean, all the way from the stomach, the end of the stomach, to this area, that's small intestine. I've got some other diagrams that will show the three regions of the small intestine, so they'll happen later. This structure is the cecum. Now the cecum is a blind ended pouch that lies basically at the junction of the small intestine and the large. The small intestine ends, there's the cecum, and the large intestine starts. Okay, so let's do large intestine, this thing right there. And then we end in an anal opening or the anus. Okay, so that's my generic track. I do want one more thing to tell you about, but let me go back here for, to remind you. Salivary glands connected via a ductwork to the GI tract. Likewise, exocrine pancreas, likewise, liver. Those three tissues that I just mentioned are called the accessory digestive glands. Other places might call them accessory digestive organs. They're exocrine in nature. They're going to put their product into a ductwork, and it goes to what's called a free surface. You might say, what is a free surface? A free surface is any place where there's not other tissue. So look at my red laser pointer up here by that salivary gland. This is a free surface. Down here in the small intestine, it's a free surface because this material is coming out of the duct and it's not going, it's not being pressed by other tissue. It's got a free surface. For example, the surface of your skin is also a free surface. So like a sweat gland expels sweat up into the surface of your skin and that's also a free surface. Okay, now I've got three other drawings or illustrations that depict the gastrointestinal tract. Let me start with a rabbit here. Enlarge it, and you can see, and I just want to show you how other people depict some of these tissues. Look it up here in the head region. Look at how they've depicted the salivary glands. They've got a little gland and some ductwork. Then you have the esophagus. They didn't label it. Here's the stomach, and then they've got the liver, and there's a duct going to the lumen of the small intestine. They've got the pancreas up here and having a duct to the small intestine. They've labeled this tube small intestine. Then they say functional cecum because the cecum of a rabbit is very active because a rabbit is a hindgut fermenter. They eat a lot of roughage. And then, and if you notice, it is at the junction between the small intestine and the large intestine, which they're calling colon here, blind-ended sac. 
So material comes in and it's there's muscles in the wall and it gets moved around and sooner or later it, get exp it gets expelled. And then rabbits, of course, make those little fecal pellets. Now this is look like a British spelling, right? Fecal. Fecal pellets are formed in this terminal part of the colon and then we have the anus. So that's somebody's drawing of the rabbit. Now I'm going to show you this. This is the horse, kind of a stylized one. But again, now we've got cranial up here. They don't show all the esophagus. And I think I've said this before, but you should realize that horses cannot vomit. Something about the length of the esophagus and how it is attached to the stomach, but basically horses cannot vomit, which is a little bit of a liability because dogs, cats, and people, if we eat something that's irritating our stomach, we can vomit. And of course, cats and dogs are very good at it, so horses cannot. Anyway, the stomach leads to the small intestine, and we're not seeing the whole digestive tract here, but the point is the cecum and the large colon look huge and they are okay then this leads into the small colon where we're forming the characteristic fecal shape in the horse and then we have the terminal part here is you could call it the rectum and then we have the anus or anal opening so that's somebody else's depiction and I've got one more because the more you look at the more you can learn now this one I believe is depicting a dog or a cat okay so now just trust me on that I guess the stomach it's a simple stomach there's always a curvature to the stomach this is called the greater curvature and it's not shown but oftentimes the spleen well I should say maybe almost all the time the spleen is attached to the greater curvature of the stomach and then they haven't looked labeled the pyloric valve, that's fine. But then they've got the first portion of the small intestine called a duodenum or duodenum. I don't know either way I think pronounced. But if you notice, they don't have the liver or the pancreas showing because they just wanted to concentrate on the straight tube or the, the one tube. Duodenum, and then the ileum, the three parts of the small intestine. Duodenum, duodenum, and ilium and then that's where the small intestine ends and there's kind of like a very small not much functioning cecum and again this is the British spelling right and then we have the large intestine they're gonna call it colon and ascending means there's material in here that's heading towards the cranial region and the, you know this is expanded but the cranium is up here, the head is up here. So when this material in here goes up, they call it the ascending. When it goes across the body, that's called the transverse section. And descending colon is where the material is going down away from the head region and going more caudally. Then the rectum is expanded here in this case. And then they have the anal canal. And they've tried to show there's a sphincter. That's a hard word to say in this one and they've done a great job at that. Now one thing I haven't talked much about is what the wall of the let's say small intestine looks like. So I'm going to show you that because then I want to also introduce the fact that there's a lot of nervous tissue in the GI tract. So let's do a couple um, diagrams here. This is the one I wanted to start with. If you notice this is a small intestine cut at least this part here is cut in a transverse section remember transverse perpendicular to the long axis and they've done a great job then of peeling back certain layers and then showing you how the blood supply comes in there's vein there's artery and then nerves there are nerves that actually come from the brain so the brain is communicating with the gi tract and actually some of these nerves are sending sensory information back to the brain. So wow, 
There's motor nerves that are coming and it can affect the motility of the GI tract, but then there's also nerves that are sending sensory information back to the brain. I won't read all these labels, but I wanted to show you how they depict a gland in the mucosa. A gland is got some area making a solution, a product, and it's going to put it into the lumen. And notice, beautiful, they've labeled, labeled lumen. Some of these glands are deeper into the wall, but they still project their product into the lumen. There's lymph tissue in the wall of this gastrointestinal tract. Let's say it's the intestine. And then I want to pay attention to the muscles. There's two layers of muscles. There's a circular orientation muscle, which is the inner muscle, and here's the outer one, which is longitudinal. So the circular muscle goes around the tube. Fibers are going around. Muscle cells are going around this way. The longitudinal run the length. Okay, and those two muscles then help with mixing the food that is in the small intestine. And here's another one, not as complicated, but it's very good. It's like a transverse section, and then we're looking at part of it, and we're not seeing the whole thing, but that's okay. Look at lymph node. The outer area is often called the serosa. It's kind of white and tough. And wherever you see plexes, Plexus can be different things, but in this case, it's a network of interacting nerves, okay? And oftentimes, let me get my dragger here. I like to call it the myenteric plexus, and they call it the plexus myentericus, okay? But look at, it's a network of nerves between those two muscle layers. Remember, the inner layer goes around, the outer layer goes into the screen and at, at us as we're looking at this. Anyway, it's a network of nerves that can control muscle. And in fact, these are can be connected to the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. It happens to be this network of nerves are only parasympathetic. That gets to be a little detail, but you should know that there's an enteric nervous system. I've got that word here. Enteric means intestine. And so there's this whole bunch of nerves in the digestive tract, and it's called the enteric nervous system. So I wanted to show you that. Also, they do a great job of depicting a gland that leads its product up to the lumen. And they haven't labeled lumen, but that's okay. So I thought that was another neat, neat drawing. Okay, and so what I usually try to do at the end, I'm not always perfect on this, but I try to show you the illustrations that I use to give people some credit, although I'm sure websites change and over time the links become non-functional, but at least I tried. Thanks a lot.